if you're leaning and you're comfortable leaning, that's great. If you're leaning and you wish that you were sitting on, on the floor, I, this is a very comfortable area up here. I also find this sort of like right in front of the fireplace to be a really nice spot. So I encourage you to consider either of those options. And also if you're standing but you need a chair, um, I hope you feel empowered to just, t we, I think we are all out of them unless someone has a chair next to them and they wanna raise their hand. But if you need a chair and you're standing, I hope you'll feel comfortable just tapping someone on the shoulder, asking if you can have their chair and trust that if they need their chair to someone nearby will will be able to give a chair to you. Um, but I hope that you are all comfortable. I'm so excited to be assembled with you this evening. My name is Laura Henriksen. I'm the program director here at the Poetry Project and I really can't wait to get to hear from Peter Gizzi and John Yao. I have a few quick announcements and reminders before we get started. So there's two all gender restrooms located upstairs and two more here on the first floor through the sanctuary. Um, if you need access to those first floor restrooms, just find me or anyone on staff tonight and we can help get you over there. While this is the last regular reading of our spring 2024 season, we do have a couple really fun things coming up next week too that I'd love to see you back here for. Actually, so on Monday, it's a Zoom event. We'll be celebrating um, the writing that happened in the workshops that we offered this spring. So all of the different participants will assemble to share the poems and stories that they wrote in Poetry Project workshops. And I really, really recommend tuning in for that because people are writing truly incredible work in our workshops. And I, I encourage you to check into them in the summer and fall when we have more classes. And then the very last reading of the season is a week from today on Wednesday and something that I look forward to all year. It's our volunteer and intern potluck and readings. So the people who gather to put the chairs out and to sell the books will be the ones at the podium sharing their poems and they are unsurprisingly incredible poems. So if you are around, I hope that you will come back for that. So we'll hang out at seven and have wine and seltzer and snacks and then at eight, we'll hear from the volunteers and interns and audio crew. And then I have one more special announcement tonight, which is that after 10 years of working at the Poetry Project, this spring is my last season here. Um, so this is my last regular Wednesday reading. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm getting emotional. But. <laughs> 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 Um, thank you. I'm really so, so honored to get to share it with you all and so deeply grateful to get to pass it listening to two poets who I admire so profoundly, um, Peter Gizzi and John Yao. Uh, and I'll turn it over now to Morgan Vo, the managing editor of our newsletter, to introduce Peter Gizzi. <laughs> Um, I just want to say how uh, proud I am of Laura and how grateful I am to everything that she's given to the project these this last decade. It's a really incredible contribution, and yeah, it would be <laughs> <laughs> it would be too much to try to describe all of the expansive things that she's offered this space. So I invite you to do your own research, I guess. Um, and with that, uh, it's my pleasure to invite Peter Gizzi. Uh, Peter Gizzi's Fierce Elegy. In this book, the world is a thing that we find, that we make, that we refute, that we lose. A thing that casts our shadow, a thing laying in the shadow of our stance within it. Peter's speakers are up at night, alone with their thoughts, which press with bony shoulders. Their poems seem to rise from the wake of injury, to survive but without recuperation, stepping towards an evolution that reaches beyond repair. My spirit broke long ago, he writes, so I won't be broken. Fierce elegy rests in the brackishness between body and thought, between ambition and rendition, running fingers along borders in their most jagged forms. It returns to the question of where the world begins, how it begins again and continues. Does the world really flow from the center of an eye? These poems give heft to the quote unquote intimate distance between ourselves and things. They recognize in the pictorial technologies of perspective and composition, 
modes of capture, creation, conversion, a circuitry of echo and appeal. Tonight, I am as the sky is, streaky, Peter writes. Like streaky in its lemony elegance, there is pleasure here in images of connection, relation, identification, but the book's mournfulness erupts from a confrontation with how the meaning of such connections have been overplayed. Say we are coming to the end of the world, say we have brought about its end, and that we have been able to do so because we saw ourselves in it. We saw the expansion of ourselves in its ground. We imagined it closer for our enrichment. Then say that in that process, we wedded ourselves to the very world we were forcing under. What will become of these selves when this world can no longer be sustained? Peter is asking more than just how we will eat. Where are you now, he asks. Now only words for lost things language marching into empire, starving the words, light throwing rhythmic shadows, Doppler and strange, where are you? We find ourselves at the horizon line and then we chase the sun until it disappears. Peter looks for what is left to say at midnight with little wind. Please welcome Peter Gizzi to the Poetry Project. <laughs> Morgan for that extraordinarily generous and thoughtful introduction. I'm not quite sure I'm going to follow it, but I'll do my best. Um, so I'm going to begin with an earlier poem. Um, as many of us know, we've been losing lots of people in a strange season, such as life. Um, so let me see how I'm going to do this. I'll do it like this. And uh, so I thought I would begin with this poem thinking of our friends. And the title seemed appropriate. A note on the text. The good poets defy things with their heart. This is how a fragment enters the people. Don't say beauty, say the people say it is through chance that writing entered the people, their imagery and love of nature in glutted flowers, this place of fleshlessness, hear their song, the only recourse of sun, even its smallest syllables can be sown into the mouth. It is on the tongue the sun abides, two syllables fastened to each end to stretch the vocal pattern, its linen-like thread. So as you see, I'm going to depress you all tonight. Um, <laughs> it's where I live. Mm. But for me, um, elegy is a reasonable way to understand objective reality. Um, it's a useful tool, particularly in this 21st century of one more interlocking, accelerating crisis after another that comes to no resolve. Um, the knowledge of periodicity, that nothing's here forever, seems to be a reasonable way to understand the objective world. It's what we can all share. And um, I'd like to think that joy and sorrow are a very complex ecosystem, and you can't have one without the other. For, some, for, some, for me, joy is often amplified by sorrow, um, but I don't think of it as sad. Um, so that's all I'm going to say, and then I'm going to read, but I want to say congratulations to Laura on her new book, and I want to thank her for all her work, and, um, and I'm also really happy to be here with John, who I've known forever. Um, I started a journal when I was 26, the little magazine Oblique, and John was in the inaugural issue, and then he was in many subsequent issues. Um, he, you know, was a core member of that project, and um, I learned a lot early on from John about a variety of artists, and one of them, Trevor Winkfield, a beloved friend of all these years. Um, so, yeah, that's me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read around in my last three books, because it's all the same. It's all what it is, and uh, I... I think that's the way I'm going to go. I've been doing this recently. 
It's been interesting to read around in my work because it kind of reminds me that, I, yeah, I guess I had a life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. Hello? Okay, so this first poem, so I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to read. Okay. This is, this is working? Yeah, okay. Well, now it's too low. I can't see the page. All right. Fine spot unknown. Thus far we have spoken only the codes, a litany of survival. Thus spoke the silvered asphodel next to the factory ruin. Sound carries on water. My subject is the wind, to take umbrage at what a tree can do, watching one single birch become lightning, stunning the sky. Landscape is a made thing, to see the mind seeing itself, to see thought, a wing in night, the long brooding, take it, listen, the night is orchestral when the power's on, everything disporting, a furred wand upon nothingness. I get it, it was good to leave the world, to find myself in thou. There's a lot to be said for seeing in the dark and more to the light when there's nothing to see. If I write about the moon, it's because it's there. I am landlocked, surrounded by rivers and lakes, pills and leaves. I saw a better life. It was far off, sun on moss next to a friend, the softening air, the dandelion fluff. It was kind of real and kind of not, can't see it today. And out of nothing, breath, a beast-like shadow in the glass. If I brought back every feeling I had, where would I put them? What could they mean to this world on the floor? It was best to let the moon unravel and focus the truth of the music. It was best to let the music unravel and focus the truth of night like when I found you in the back of my mind. I am talking about people and the night, people inside the night, the night and what we are made of, the things and the people, the signal and its noise. Three poems from a series about language. Archaeophonics. I'm just visiting this voice. I'm just visiting the molecular structures that say what I am saying. I am just visiting the world at this moment, and it's on fire. It's always been on fire. I'm saying this, and it's saying me. That's how it works, seesaw-like. The archive in the mouth, and the archive is on fire. That's the story, the sun and the body, and the body and the sun. It was like this, just like this, the world that's coming toward me, and the world around me. Around me are words saying this, saying fire, saying something, or all of it. Strangeness becomes you. The old language is the old language. It don't mean shit. It's not where you begin. It's how you finish. Everyone's got beer muscles when they're young. Try as you must, break as you will. Solo in space, clinging to space. Fuck, the air said, passing a corner. A long, ropey snot hitting a gutter. To know something and fail. Why discount it? The onslaught of eyes beneath a fuck you sky. The syntax breaks down its mangled draft and says, one day the poor will have nothing to eat but the rich. I hate that when syntax connects me to the rich. Reverb, 
I hate how syntax connects me to shit. Or say the day is jeweled and burning, its fires banking, and none of its letters produce the horror at the heart of the index. The old document hangs over the twin stairs of murder and something else, that original slap of glove. The project is archival, all that blood in the mouth. The old language could have told you it's too late. We watched you die, watched you move through shocking losses and the solo flight you are taking back into the old language. It's the same, but different, different now. The mouth knows the bit, the taste of it. And on that note, a very bright title coming up. Speech Acts for a Dying World. A field sparrow is at my window tapping at its reflection a tired antique god trying to communicate. It's getting to me. As I set out to sing the nimbus of flora under a partly mottled sky. As I look at the end and sing, so what? Sing, live now, thinking, why not? I'm listening and receiving now, and it feeds me. I'm always hungry when the beautiful is too much to carry inside my winter when my library is full of loss, full of wonder, as the polis is breaking and casts a shadow over all of me, thinking of it, when the shadows fall in ripples, when the medium I work in is deathless, and I'm living inside one great example of stubbornness as my head is stove in by a glance, as the day's silver tip buds sway in union, waving to the corporate sky, when I said work and meant lyric, when I thought I was done with the poem as a vehicle to understand violence, I thought I was done with the high-toned, shitty world, done with the voice and its constituent pap. Call down the inherited phenomenal world when it's raining in the book, lost to the world in an abundance of world, like listening to a violin, when the figure isn't native but the emotion is, when everything is snow and what lies ahead is a mesmer's twirling locket. I thought I was done with the marvel of ephemeral shadow play, the great design and all that. I thought I was done with time, its theatricality, glamour and guff. Gusting cloud, I see you, I become you in my solitary thinging here in partial light. When I said voice, I meant the whole unholy grain of it, it felt like paradise, meaning rises and sets, now a hunter overhead, now a bear at the pole, and the sound of names, the parade of names. Revisionary. I've decided to let my inner weather out. Even in the nerves flashing, some things are only shadow. What's up with that? My muse bruises me. Some days I sit hours to be relieved by a word. Today's word is invisible. I'm putting trouble into place, turning toward what is, listening to stone translate into silence. Here is an old rock covered with lichen in the mossy forest inside the self. I like it here when it's green. This is me evolving. I'm hanging on a whisper. Certain prayers are tied to this ribbon. How in hell can nature throw clay into art, into a speaking being, into air? I saw a world that was an afternoon 
this cloud in my hand, sky pouring into sky, reflecting the absolute of the lake, the flock in its tangle of shadow. Nearing the end, I could hear a lark, its trill fixing itself to my brain. It seemed a thing becoming a wave, a thing dissolving into the world as I found it, illegible, agrammatical, to parse the velocity of trusses and stars flowering here at the edge, calling me. I wasn't sure what that noise was. I thought maybe it was having a stroke or something. Um, it's basically what the digital world is. Um, we're all out of our minds. Mm. Okay. So, this is a street near where I live. That I saw the light on Nanatuck Avenue. That every musical note is a flame native in its own tongue. That between bread and ash there is fire that the day swells in crests, that I found myself born into it with sirens and trucks going by out here in a poem, that there are other things that go into poems like the pigeon, cobalt, dirty windows, sun, that I have seen skin in marble, eye in stone, that the information I carry is mostly bacterial, that I am a host, that the ghost of the text is unknown, that I live near an Air Force base and the sound in the sky is death, that sound like old poetry can kill us, that there are small things in the poem, paper clips, gauze, tater tots, knives, that there can also be emptiness fanning out into breakfast rolls, macadam, stars, that I am hungry, that I seek knowledge of the ancient sycamore that also lives in the valley where I live, that I call to it, that there are airships overhead, that I live alone in my head out here in a poem near a magical tree, that I saw the light on Nanatuck Avenue and heard the cry of a dove recede into a rustle, that its cry was quiet light falling into a coffin, that it altered me, that today the river is a camera obscura bending trees, that I sing this of metallic shimmer, sing the sky, the song, all of it, and wonder if I am dying, would you come back for me? That was an expensive one to write caring for my brother who's dying of ALS. I don't wish that upon anyone. I'm going to read this poem because it's someone that both John and I loved and uh, that's all I need to say. Creeley's song. All that is lovely in words, even if gone to pieces, all that is lovely gone, all of it for love and autobiography, as if I were writing this. Hello, listen, the plan is the body, and all of it for love now in pieces, all that is lovely echo still in life and death, still memory gardens open onto windows, lovely the charm that mirrors all that was, all that is lovely in a song. This title kind of says it all. Dissociadelic. To be a desperate player in the invisible world, this is something different. To have crossed over into ink and to loiter and bleed out on the occasion of the universe. I've learned this. My spirit broke long ago, so I won't be broken. This is something quite different inside the song. Blurs, gestures, something loved. 
Come as you are, collapsing and thriving with endings like beginnings, when eight ball says, ask again. When the day reveals the prismatic systems of loss, a blinding shimmer on new blacktop in a sun shower, everything always in black, black wax, black dress, black hole, whatever. When you're brought to your knees, sing a song of praise. When you're gutted, embrace the world, FTW. There's nothing like it. Release the darkness to new lichen. But I found a way to say no to the wood in my house. It kept creaking, wouldn't stop talking. I found a way to say no. I need to be standing in the warmth of the wood that the sun made. I need to find myself dissolving. Otherwise, it is all. Otherwise, I'm lost. Did I say that? I saw the frill of light today walking on the path. Could you hear the stirring in the wood, pine needles in the branches? Was it wind or a creature? Am I here or is it over? This was the first day, the nothing day, in the nothing year. It gave me courage. It gave hints of blue, clouds electrical and dancing. It gave me rays I've never seen, shooting down, touching things. This was the first day. I did try to weave these poems to make some kind of coherence. Um, I wasn't going to talk, but this one, my beloved friend Trevor Wingfield and I took a pilgrimage as we do to New Bedford to see a show by the great turn of the century American artist Albert Pinkham Ryder, who was so important to um, the non representational painters of the 40s and 50s. Um, this poem has nothing to do with that, but um, <laughs> it comes out of that experience. Notes on sound and vision. The consequence of flesh also comes into the painting. The attitude of landscape escapes into a body, thinking of the body, the dark octave unsettled. How far can vision take one? How far do we see into the painting, thinking of painting, thinking of canvas, or the hand that shaped the art-loving distance, or the shape of the human? and the shape of sleep in its dim shore, its shadow sand, marshland, and a road. Sometimes it's hard to know the outline of a body. There's so many people inside, so much room for love and mayhem. For now, come close, come closer, come into the reeds, come into the, come into the intimate distance of the picture field. So much room for death and song. Come into the room where the viewer is the viewed. When the thing itself becomes the thing itself, there are so many people here. It's the longest poem I read, but it happens quickly because it's in little fragments. Um, it's called Nimbus. Nimbus, in this hand a chromosome, the mystery of the ordinary, becoming the me and I, a rosary ready to turn a hunger for real things like a wave, to salute the real when twilight comes on, breathe in, breathe out, an archetype calling to it, the earth in orange light, a regalia of lost music, no more alive than me. This is not a small poem, everything in starlight, 
thin snow, fragile and dream-lapsed, warped by wind, or anything made of waves, like my body and the rest of the day, Monday and April pierced like an echo, outlasting me, as if nothing could polish the sky, where the present and phantom touch, where mirrors, etc., turn like weather. It's so random becoming a self, the secret to my own piece of sky, behaving as clouds do, another day, a macular blue, white steel, a swatch of green, the afternoon reflected green, wavy, transparent, and shadows turn nothing to nothingness, enter the O in breath, an antiquity of thought. A notebook opens. There are windows in the notebook and a road, birds, houses, trees, etc. Hunger for the word flower where bees work the bell. It is the eye that creates a world, accepting rain and punishment, the yellows and oranges, the green time, the physical. Some days it's a blue world, a buzz of flies, somewhere music, this dance of the actual giving itself to the eyes, a reflecting surface designed for survival, every glance some circumference of shadow, calling into the psyche's paper blue, hieratic light. Cardinals flaunt their red into a gentle rain, soft and constant, when elsewhere becomes an image, a thing to live with, a worn feeling, an old force softening glass. Is there more sadness in beauty than beauty in sadness? The fluorescent afternoon sang. Still with me? A little worried. Okay. It's quiet. Ecstatic joy and its variants. You can see I'm a crazy person, right? You get it, right, John? Yeah. <laughs> Ecstatic joy and its variants. As surely as this is about seeing you dance naked, it is also about the sky and Mahler in the wan distance heard by a child. As surely as the sadness never leaves and that music heals the night with its deeps and neon. As surely as the glow of the radiator at 3 a.m., a line of inquiry, souvenirs, a signature for the sun. O oh, bed of stray barrettes, discourse and water, bed of laughter, hot takes, dried blood, bed of cedar boughs, pinhole light, thing music. Surely this is about water jetting from a spring, a languid rafting with no particular destination, as the old arguments, humans, how they rhyme, stutter, get lost. This is also about conversations with the dead, the only honest definition of silence. Surely you are not listening to the words I am singing about the last day of my life, the gift of blood, the perfect text, are not all the sounds on my lyre about you. Like a seam through the sky, glitter, sometime youth. Surely this is about the one thing you do to me, places not even music is touched. And in my outrage, I am immortal. Because I love, I am here. Hmm. I'm not going to read this poem because I'm reading too many. I'm going to read like two more, but I love the first line of this poem because... It's like the best line I've ever written. <laughs> Hold on to the afterlife of the beloved. It's the only thing that's yours. Live with that one. Okay, two more. I'm going to read this for Colin. He asked for it. When orbital proximity feels creepy, 
Right now, there are teenage microwaves screaming through your body as you are having text with me. This is the moment I'll need you to sing with me. I'm making my way in some dark room looking for other structures to love. From the left, something speaking I can't identify. The floor goes unfixed and moving, and this doesn't happen only at night. But during the day, when I don't want to think on it, that I saw a blood orange ball caught out my window, that I'm listening to light, and it said time. I'm listening to time. It says, ha, you need to be howling at bloody torn space, need to be spooked out of your hidey hole and its glowing mess. But I love this ball I'm riding on, the strange hunk of metal and rock whizzing around my loves and my loving. The fact I spin and it spins and everything is spinning close up. From far away, it's so cool. I guess they call this physics or they call it laws. If they're so well made, why do we suffer? I thought the day was opening, but now I see it's already gone. Outside, the cruel dove has a broken window. The day isn't friendly. Who are you to me? A way to understand the floor, the floor that holds me up and leaves me standing. I don't know where to go, me, Tuesday at 5 p.m. What does it mean to be in a room, any room? The wind banging against the clabbered. I know enough to see the cracked pane isn't going to be fixed any time soon. Who has time for such things in the song? Breaking, blooming, the wobble of light on wood grain late in the day, in the loneliness of orange, in the loveliness of orange. And the last poem, very short. Sadly, it's perennially, you know, it's just apt, it's like so depressing. Um, I'll read this short poem to finish. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, Morgan, John. The blossom is stronger than us. But to want the beauty of the hollyhock, Augustine sad reading in the alcove, so much sand and wind with us all this time, so many bullets and boys crying, mother, before the weather, but why after all this nothing but the changing weather, playing the changes, the children, in the magnitude, love, in the horror, love. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. That was so beautiful. I feel I feel um, this whole room was filled with with the vastest orchestra. That was beautiful. Um, let's take a quick five minute break. Bathrooms upstairs and then through the sanctuary. If you step outside to smoke, please do put your butts in a trash can, lest the church will be really mad at us. But we'll reassemble in five minutes to hear from John Yao.
All right, everybody, we're going to start gathering ourselves, gathering our attention for the second half of our reading. If you want to find your seats, get comfortable, settle in, hold on to the thought that you're having so that you can share it after the reading with the people that you're chatting with. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. I hope everyone has found a place where they can be comfortable. There are still some spots up in the front if you are leaning but would rather sit on the ground. Um, I am so thrilled now to get to introduce John Yao. While out here, it might be the green nights of summer, snow is still drifting at an angle over John Yao's newest collection, Tell It Slant. Quote, I turn into drops of ink and snow, settling into the repaired space of this poem he writes early in the book. And soon after, it is snowing in these poems, which were once branches catching the snow, unquote. This image of transformation through accumulation over time, accumulation that holds the promise of its loss, snowbanks build, snow melts, sooner or later it snows again, elegantly echoes the book's formal exploration of repetition and return. Through the inclusion of many pantoums and serial poems, part of the slant until its slant is cyclical. Lines recur like memories in evolving contexts. What's past is never far away. That's really satisfying. Um, the beginnings at the end again. The repaired space of the poem does not betray or attempt to veil the broken space of the poem, but instead coats it in light. Generous in both music and erudition, Yao's ekphrastic poetry has long fascinated me. I am grateful to be invited into his active and attentive conversation with the visual accruals of our world, to follow him through the windows of movies and paintings that he opens with his poems, to look with him into Constance Dowling's eyes. His serial poems unfold into increasingly complex relationships, developing intricacies between the parts and the whole, each refracted fragment addressing and disrupting the next. This challenge to linearity more brightly illuminates the mysteries of storytelling and biography, of research and knowledge, of time and change. Quote, Leave something behind each moment you breathe, Yao writes. Even in sleep, shedding continues, even in this poem, unquote. Like dreams, everything left behind leaves its residue on everything that remains. Everything that remains melts and reforms, becoming branches, becoming poems. Please join me in welcoming John Yao. to get through this reading. So I don't have to pee like an old man. Sorry, Peter. Uh, I'm gonna read from, I'm gonna read from two books and then all new poems after that. I'm being told that I don't look and act Chinese for all the Asians in the room. There's a lot of us. I'm deeply, I'm being told that I don't look and act Chinese. I'm deeply grateful for your good opinion. I'm honestly indignant. I am, I confess, a little discouraged. I'm inclined to agree with you. I'm incredulous. I'm in a chastened mood. I am far more grieved than I can tell you. I am naturally overjoyed. I'm not gonna let you pay me idle compliments. I'm not in the least surprised. 
I'm not sure I can manage it. I'm persuaded by your candor. I'm quite discomfited. I'm so glad you think that. I'm sorry to disillusion you. I can, use, I can assure you it is most painful to, hear, to me to hear you say it like that. I can easily understand your astonishment. I can only tell you the bare facts. I detest exaggeration. I don't know quite why you would say that. I hadn't thought of it in that light. I've never heard it put so well. I see it from a different angle. I stand corrected. Uh, this is a poem dedicated to Joseph Donahue and Albert Mobilio. It's called Opinion Sonnet 18. A center, and these are a lot of these were written during COVID, as you'll quickly figure out. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh -uh. I think it, Castaneda called that agreement. A senator is a larval forum known to sprawl in leather chairs. A wet market is where you go to buy a bucket of unwashed food. A laboratory is what you need to coil together more diseases. A car is the rickshaw you drive when you cannot leave town. A hair salon is a mirror where you breed more germs. A restaurant is a table that lets you sneeze into the food. A president is an elected official, official who cannot tell the truth to his children. A secretary of state is a poncho in charge of manufacturing rumors. A housing complex is where you go to die among friends. A sweatshop is one way to help shoppers save money. A whistleblower goes to jail for crimes others commit. A scientist is a shade baboon who fits neatly into a lab coat. A buffoon is a person who believes the president first. A patriot is often identified by his or her misspelled tattoos. They tell Jane Alice Peters, I like sitting in hotel lobbies that are as big as the apse of a cathedral and strung with Christmas lights. I like it when my posterior sinks into the cushion provided by the hotel management for exactly this encounter between lower extremity and nuanced comfort. I like letting my spine and all the flesh that surrounds it fall back into the carefully rounded, slightly tilting support that is attached to an elevated painting, pairing of horizontal cushions that rest securely on four elegantly turned legs. I like the silver claws that form the chair's seat. I like knowing the architecture of this assembly was constructed with human ease in mind. I like pretending that I belong in a lobby festooned with polished brass fixings reminiscent of another era or framed by fluted marble columns harkening back to an even earlier era. I like knowing I can travel back in time. This is when I start replaying my, fav my favorite interlude when I began dreaming of meeting Carol Lombard, who died in a plane crash in Mount Potosi, Nevada, age 33. This happened on January 16th, 1942. Today is January 17th, 2019, more than 75 years later. Is there a hotel in Mount Potosi? Is it named after Lombard? third wife of Clark Gable. I like burrowing inside the extinct topography resurrected by young hotel designers, their manufactured version of our collective longing. I like their efforts to harness the barely controllable desire we have to step away from the time we inhabit into a hologram sector that's not been overrun by apocalyptic data. I like knowing that the scar a car accident left on Lombard's face could not be completely erased, and then we can see its trace on her cheek like a horizon line 
when the camera moves in close as in Hands Across the Table, 1935, co-starring the charmless Fred McMurray. A light knowing that she did not want to simper prettily or scream in terror on the screen. A light knowing that the E was added onto her name by mistake and that she decided to keep it. I like knowing that she took life as it came, even if I'm not of that ilk and do not want to go down that torturous path. And the last poem I read in this book is called Nursery Song. It's after Sean Bonney. Don't say, <clears throat> Don't say pandemic lockdown. Say fuck the rich. They're private island getaways. Say, fuck their Aspen Lodges stocked with climate-controlled volcanoes and children named after weather stations and rare cheeses. Don't say clubbed and beaten. Say, fuck clubbing and slumming. Say, fuck following and liking. Don't say assortment of pretty much everything you can imagine at a loss for words beyond your wildest dreams. Don't say courts, countertops, home theater, private cul-de-sac, second getaway. Say, fuck the rich, their carbon footprint, their dinosaur ways. Don't say, stay at home orders, essential workers, front lines of death. Say, fuck fabulous gym rat, TV personality smile, lifestyle influencer. Don't say, drowning in debt, jobless rollout, prioritize assisted living. Say, fuck lounging by the pool, swimming into the future, moonlight stroll. Don't say, another milestone, strain capacity, possible spread. Say, fuck galas and red carpets, fuck blockbusters and special consultants, fuck jewel and social crown, fuck emulation and following its footsteps, fuck controversial outfits glowing in the dark, fuck felt gluttony and perfect abs. I don't have those, <laughs> in case you guess. Don't say going hungry, say fuck jaw-dropping. Don't say hoi polloi, riffraff and pros. Don't say back to normal or the way things used to be. Don't say, let's see what the future holds. Say, fuck the little golf cart stretch limo they rode in on. Say, fuck their followers and their dribbling ways. Don't say viral, say virus. Say, fuck your pumpkin spice. Don't say, comfortable at home attire, loungewear, soon to be biggest trends. Say, fuck whole new meaning and affordable chic. Don't say, the right balm for wardrobe doldrums. Don't say fashion plate and ice cream colored costume. Don't say luxury matching designer errands. Say fuck the old self, the complete overhaul. Destroy all evidence of inner calm. Don't say stable environment, outdoor grounds, privacy, and for the kids. Don't say pitchfork diplomacy, flag stabbing, constitutional gripes. Say, fucking bloody thorn in your side. I got nowhere to go but up. <laughs> Thank you. And so I'll read from this uh, more recent book called Tell It Slant. I'll just read the epic, whatever it's called in the beginning. Because you all have heard this phrase a million times, and I'll just remind you, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. <laughs> Emily Dickinson. <laughs> There's another thing to go with it. You can't scare me, you slant-eyed yellow bastard. CIA agent. The Kentucky Fried Movie, 1977. I love that I could put those two together. We want to make that movie famous. This is secretly dedicated to James Merrill. Memories of Charles Street, Boston. 
One day I wake up and my hair has turned white and I'm no longer Chinese. I want to ask my mother about this change in my appearance, but she's been dead longer than I've been alive. You have to take the good with the bad, she used to tell me, before trying to drown me in the bathtub. My father sat in the next room in his imported black underwear, smoking a perfumed cigar and jerking off in front of the television he had dragged in from the street. It never worked. It still doesn't. And the blue stains on the chair are why I never sit there. Chinatown Blues. Don't keep saying poetry makes nothing happen. I'm not trying to be your surrogate chaplain. I'm going to grow up and be a hatchet man, doing the sharp and shiny thing, being the best I can. Don't tell me the wood is far too green or yellow or that Mr. Frost, protector of fences, is a jolly good fellow. I'm still going to grow up and tell it slant. Don't even try and tell me I can't. Stop reminding me I have to watch what I say. Be polite or I'll have to pay and pay. I'm still going to grow up and be a hatchet man, doing the sharp and shiny thing, being the very best I can. Um, this is from a series called uh, Li Shang Yin Enters Manhattan, and I'm going to read... Uh, six, seven, and 14. Six. Well, now you know the numbers. You don't have to ask me. <clears throat> I keep my remaining glands in a jar by the nightstand. I live in a condo villa and drink tall glasses of cold plum juice. Give me edible sermons and I'll recycle your sentiments. Display another filament binge as I grind the heart loose. Pick slips of masticated plastic from plates of steaming viscera. These are slippery hills we're hooked forward to. Lumps and bones spilling lard of our common stock market. Lined with barnacles and crackling bunkum courtesy of old world ways. My name is Captain Manatee, Oboe Steamhouse, Elgin Relic. I sing and fly in the opera known as the Lost United Fates. Picketed gates or heads on plates weighed on upon stack of white and swans. Headline piled up with more bastions. Suspects speak of terminal clutter. But comic relief is when you don't pee in your pants by a flooded highway. Seven. I inherited yellow shack and shabby body no one wanted to move into. I took up residence there as cubits of greased windpipes sounded their pavement splatter, and I decided on glow in the dark pencils as fast track to masterpiece and high yield cash return while ogling owls earmarked by smoke rinsed skyline. I've got a carpet I can wear to the good ridden store. Oh, producer of precious toil, did you drink your barium today? I don't keep socks in a drawer and I don't keep stocks in a portfolio. I don't believe earth is a barbell you hoist to heaven's penthouse suite. Birth is when you receive your first distortion. How many days in a peep show did you keep your glistening bristles behind sludge pump? Post and beam bracket tractor fish fill the dreaming pond. Don't fall asleep beside your latest broken paragraph. You never know when a stone might fall out of the blinking sky. And this is the last in the series. And then I'll read new poems. Peter said something about that, but I won't repeat it. He said he hated me for writing so much. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write them. They just came to me. I don't write these things. I have take no responsibility. Someone else wrote them. Some guy named John Yao keeps mailing them to me. <laughs> Last poem in the series. I left the drugstore and went and sat in the park. What language of waste had I been listening to without hearing what is there? 
day's grinding crust, depositing scales of human skin on sills and in our hair, constant swirl we sit and stand in, move through our ancestors all around us, waiting to be swept up once again from sidewalk and chair, barbershop pile up of hair, dust on hair and in the air around us. What we lose of our bodies does not come back. Leave something behind each moment you breathe, even in sleep shedding continues, even in this poem which I wrote before we met and after we parted. What happened in that interval, interval I still circle around, blossoms of magenta dust lifted to your lips. All right. I don't think I've ever read any of these in public. Clips, claps, and clumps. The beginning seems familiar, which makes everyone anxious. The man on a bicycle is authorized to crash into the iron fence separating neighbors from their loved ones. Other than her long neck, there's nothing memorable about her, even to this day. The grandfather clock in the funeral parlor needs a new minute hand. Before slipping on their Halloween masks, two hot dog vendors stop and squat on a traffic island planted with tulips and daffodils, gifts of the bulb society. She tries not to think about the future. An elderly woman with a bowl haircut opens the front door and yells at the ocean. A school mascot dies of self-induced asphyxiation over the long weekend. She looks at him with her droopy eyes and sneers until his lips quiver. A passenger boards the train carrying a bag full of children's secrets which she stole from an orphanage. The director of the funeral parlor tears open the package. Everyone ignores the pair of rubber masks weaving their way through the crowd. The ocean is green and syrupy like cough medicine kept past its expiration date. The red bicycle remains shiny and new. She tries to ignore the headlights of the past shining in her rear view mirror. Two middle-aged women wearing identical blonde wigs begin exchanging notes in the parking garage beneath a popular restaurant. The neighbors agree the punishment should exceed his crime by a small, but verifiable margin, which becomes the source of a long-standing feud. If past and future move at the same speed, she's been out of step since she was born. A young girl playing hooky finds a blonde wig and decides to give it to her grandmother for her birthday. One of the squatting men is secretly relieving himself. After it turns cerulean blue, a young woman pours the syrup into another bottle and stores it in an industrial freezer. A man who was pronounced dead many times before wakes up and turns back the clock. Uh, where do you put these things when you're done? I think John Leas just threw them on the floor. Lost painting. A stirring of the inhibited senses until she became pigment on the surface. Others lined up and began dreaming, unrepentant wastrels. There's no clock to guide them, no sheep or police officer to show them which way the path will betray their footsteps. Addendum, she didn't die because they said she did on her way to the far off mountains, a city bellowing with smoke a stone cottage in the forest where the woodcutter has just cut off his hand. That was just the way a poet saw her in a chrysanthemum time during her pilgrimage to the incomprehensible. He did not know she was walking in star sunlight. He was too far away to see her profile, too blind to realize she was beside her every step of the way. Disquieted, 
by hearing her name whispered by ghosts gathered along the river, soaking away the stains of, the, of their last life in the frothy current. She did not fit into the folds of the painting releasing her, and he knew it. Documentary Cinema. Money moves the herd, divides the nods from the hard-nosed, keeps others lacquered shut. Occasionally, unexpected turbulence from a recalcitrant stump lantern introduces confusion, but these interruptions are not unexpected and easily papered over. While across the aisle, another globe sets off sparks. What animal do you most resemble when you are not an armadillo, surrounded by sordid ornaments, sweaty to the touch? Tender bellow mortified by fat. Postcard gargoyle in need of a second bath. Mouthful of severed thumbs. Pauses in leaky silence. Station changes. Climb into latest examples of a ruined civilization, what we call the present. Moon pasted frozen bright on a wall near names of repeatedly missing. Adjacent to commuter clatter, some filled with hard eyes. Yield cover pandering to paper blocks, championing virtues of carbon trash. Rod circulating cups on ice, another bleeding sky cools at its own pace. Silent film without music. I do do things, other things besides watch movies all night. Think. What if you watch the movie? Uh, what if you watch the movie in a language you don't understand, and are asked to communicate the plot to someone who has never grasped what you're saying? Said the poet, laughing at a familiar predicament. The faces and feet offer no clues. Suppose talking about the movie reminds you of the first person whose tongue touched yours and said, kissing is like rolling little migraine pillows round on the floor when no one is looking, and that being in love is like trying to understand a silent movie that no one has ever described accurately. All that exists are on the pages upon pages of words that have been written about bound and embossed in numbered volumes. What has puzzled the scholars who have poured over these tom tomes is that each description denies the existence of all others so that no one has ever been able to summarize the plot or lack of one, fragment of fragments, some of them marked only by the shadows of clouds that were in the sky that day, not so long ago, before memory to become a phantom limb. Well, speaking of the dead, Bryce Martin via Hanshan. So it brings his words and the words of Hanshan together. Because he and I used to sit in a studio and talk about him. <clears throat> My paintings are made in a highly subjective state within Spartan limitations. I chose a distant place to dwell, a garden you can visit when I'm not there. Sometimes scholar, artist, and poet, I collect rocks and sing lullabies to butterflies. The snow will bury my body. Will it matter who reads my work when I'm gone? I chose a distant place to dwell, a garden you can visit when I'm not there. I paint as I see and feel, and I have very strong feelings. The snow will bury my body. Will it matter who reads my work when I'm gone? My only joy is poetry, scribbling and scribbling until my brain falls out. I paint and s as I see and feel, and I have very strong feelings. 
people ask, my, ask the way to my studio, I tell them I'm a chameleon. My only joy is poetry, scribbling and scribbling until my brain falls out. I work with the illusion of light. My heart's not the same as yours. People ask the way to my studio. I tell them I'm a chameleon. My paintings are made in a highly subjective state within Spartan limitations. I work with the illusion of light. My heart's not the same as yours. Sometimes scholar, artist, and poet, I collect rocks and sing lullabies to butterflies. And this is uh, not my last, I'm gonna read three pantoums, I guess. So this is not my last, because I'm still alive. Not my, not my last pantoum. I cannot remember the last time I wanted to make sense. It's not that I'm interested in being senseless or absurd. There is no Mr. Jones, and I'm not knocking on anyone's door. I get the last laugh because I know you won't love me until I'm dead. It's not that I'm interested in being senseless or absurd. You are smug to think I'm trying to shake you up, a sweaty little turd. I get the last laugh because I know you won't love me until I'm dead. You can call this writing or even poetry if you want, just not a cry of despair. You're smug to think I'm trying to shake you up, a sweaty little turd. Why do you always bring up resemblance of the complete lack thereof? You can call this writing or even poetry if you want, just not a cry of despair. There are certain things that seem extreme, even for me. Why do you always bring up resemblance or the complete lack thereof? When you start counting or stressing syllables, give me a call. There are certain things that seem extreme, even for me. I've never taken a walk in a forest that I didn't like. When you start counting or stressing syllables, give me a call. I cannot remember the last time I wanted to make sense. I've never taken a walk in a forest that I didn't like. There is no Mr. Jones, and I'm knock knocking on anyone's door. Uh, all right, we all suffer from this problem, so I thought I'd air it out. <laughs> Imposter syndrome. I bet you all have it. You just don't want to admit it. <laughs> Imposter syndrome interior monologue. Your triumphs, adventures, and beneficence are beneath notice, for all you are is bloviating baloney, perfume putrefaction sequestered on a discount aisle. A fire sale at a flea market is too good for you. Repentance is the acid you will gladly gulp when I'm done with you. You will try and join a pilgrimage marching to hell, but they won't have you stain them any further. You'll wish you were lying fully clothed in a cemetery during a heat wave. You'll pray that you're impotent. At meetings of any kind, you will announce that you are a sterile byproduct of an unwanted meeting of opposites, that your parents were feral barbarians gleaming beneath a street lamp that you're learning to make yourself disappear in a primeval mist. You know you need to have your little boat sunk once again. Uh, I don't know, didn't take the bus too much. You never know what you come up with. From Miyoko Ito, a wonderful painter gets a show at Matthew Marks and suddenly the art world says, oh, we love Miyoko Ito. We just ignored it so she was dead. I guess the only good painter is a dead painter. 
least to Matthew, Mark. For me, Lilko Ito, there are secrets in you in the painting you did not know are there, and you do. Pale moss green sky spread across and down, fading gently as a breeze across your face, unseen as always. A green tear along the left of what can be seen, held back from falling. Is this arch on the right the opening of a tunnel, a mirror on a bureau, or both? Where do we go when we look at what you place before us? The tunner, tunnel and mirror are open and closed. Are they striped flags in, edging, edging in from the right? Tattered rice paper, unknown for farewells. How many times did you have to say goodbye and hello in another language not your own, but it was, wasn't it? This language of paint no one else could speak. What is this red becoming brown? Tell us about a world where everything fades and nothing is left astray. Where are you standing when you dream this world that dreams you are missing? You wore your clothes inside out so no one could find you. The nearly square arrangement of four pieces of cut wood stretched with cloth. What did it say to you that you had to speak to it in colors and shapes, deposit a residue of red in an adjacent arch, changing as it rises, colors of a life thwarted and full, the permanent blush of being alive in a world that turned away and against while it held you captive. The slow sediment of those memories drifting in and out of your hours, alone in your predilections. The only place to be safe is here, in this painting, where no one could ever touch you again. There are secrets in you that you know are there, and no one else would ever know them. Secrets of the remembered earth you were snatched from, held prisoner on, walking back and forth from your barracks in the hot wind. What you would see in the mirror was not what they saw. The mirror looks back. You've already left us behind, wondering. What is behind is in front. What is in front is behind. What can you tell us about standing in a world where there's no place for you to stand but what you paint? Exiled on this earth, that island in the distance is evidence of a desire we can never grasp or arrive at. Um, okay, one more pantoon. I was trying to imagine, well, Peter Paul Rubens had all these studio assistants, and you never hear about them. They're just like blips. So I thought I would let one of them talk a little. A voice in the studio of Peter Paul Rubens. Do you know his work? There are all these pinky, fleshy bodies, right? I suddenly thought they were corpses. It's a bad day. Are these bo a voice in the studio of Peter Paul Rubens? Are these bloated corpses or pink sunlit clouds? No one could decide whether outfitted in smart attire traditional outfits or athletic gear. When will you draw the bitterness and flaming our upturned faces? Tell us which chariot will measure the daily turmoil. Whether outfitted in smart attire, traditional outfits or athletic gear, we still lean on past arguments whose expiration date has come and gone. Tell us which chariot will measure the daily turmoil. Who among us can respond patiently to the litany of anonymous complaints? We still lean on past arguments whose expiration date has come and gone while a texture of devastation shuttles its multicolored threads throughout the day. Who among us 
can respond patiently to the litany of anonymous complaints. The distribution of wealth is not about delivering buckets of free money, while a texture of devastation shuttles its multicolored threads throughout the day. I decide to wear a tuxedo complete with glossy pompadour and fly into the sun. The distribution of wealth is not about delivering buckets or free money. Our ugliness precedes us like a mirror held up to the assembling wind. Are these bloated corpses or pink sunlit clouds? No one can decide. I decide to wear a tuxedo complete with glossy pompadour and fly into the sun. Our ugliness precedes us like a mirror held up to the assembling wind. When we draw the bitterness inflaming our upturned faces. I think I have two more. Is that when you're supposed to announce it, when you have two left, Peter? I'm just trying to follow your instruction. All right, I have two more. One's 100 pages, but I won't read the whole thing. <laughs> oh, I'd love to do that. When I'm 80, fuck it. I'm just going to be totally obnoxious. If I live that long. If I don't, someone will do it in my place. I'll nominate someone. We'll draw lots. All right, sorry. I'm just, I don't know why I'm trying to neaten up because I'm actually a total slob as anyone who's been to my house knows. Writer's aid, we all need this. <coughs> Writer's aid. A man who gets to eat a steak as big and soft as a baseball glove is supposed to be lucky in love. That's what I read on a wall yesterday. It was written in clean type script above a drawing of an empty plate dotted with blobs of mustard and ketchup. I don't know who put it there. I don't know why this is true, because no one I know has ever eaten a steak drooping over the sides of a plate, waiting to have a fork and knife plunge into its tender flesh. No one I know is in love either, but that's a different story. Perhaps this is why I spend my days getting on long silver buses and sitting next to you, whomever you are, and wherever you're going. I never say much more than, excuse me, or hello, sorry to take up the space beside you. That's because I'm waiting for you to open your mouth, and for the words that you have stored up inside, the ones knotted around your heart, to spill out a soft, steady torrent that might cause whiplash in the unprepared or ill-equipped. You always look different. Well, I'm just the same, a blank book you want to fill with your tales of torment and disaster. And this is the last poem I read. Um, it's actually, I'm supposed to have a new one selected come out next year. Uh, and I think, I don't know if this will be the title of it, or you're just supposed to call your new and selected, new and selected, but I feel like that title's already been used. So, this, this, so I've been thinking of calling it Diary of Small Discontents. It's all numbered, but I won't read the numbers because I assume all of you know how to count to 12. I know that's a big assumption. And America. Oh, 11. See, I don't even got it right. <laughs> you know. I thought I wrote 12. Where'd that 12 from? Anyway. The movie did not stay with me. In fact, it was never there. Later, when I realized the animal suspended all forms of broadcasting, I stopped sending messages via the usual channels. As the poet further dwindle, dwindled further into the sour, he began making gnomic pronouncements. A bird in the hand, it takes two, you just can't. Students copied the statements in the spiral notebooks, speculated on what was left out, 
and why. Rural pools of wind swirled down the street, lifting and dropping insects whose spirits had departed. You can't just, you just can't pay less than full attention to huts made with a radial arm saw. Returned to lab, went straight there from drugstore, walked under rubber clouds, found series of inappropriate messages delivered to electronic mailbox, warning shots fired. As information highway becomes increasingly crowded with squatters, the odds of shopping malls squeezed between prison complexes and gated communities multiply like fungi after rain. Have you ever thought about the fluorocarbons lurking in your spaghetti? Sobbing church bell breadstick complications. Dancing with skin. Flotilla of small scars continuously changes shape. As weeks pass, busboy thickens. Flasher flicks make brief comeback on outer fringes of suburbs. There are so many different kinds of Asians living in New York, it's getting harder to tell them apart. Soon to be a major emotional picture. A sea of bobbing pink umbrellas floods the plaza. It's proving difficult to align outer carapace with inner substance. Kulaks and kayaks drift apart in commercial. Stop waffling over your waffles, my little alphabet. Full disclosure is a come on. Went up to the coffin and kissed your cold lips goodbye. Memory of that moment returns unexpectedly while staring at computer screen. Younger brother doing the same thing. Woman who needed to be hoisted up the stairs. Talking to people who told the story rather than their names. Father counting the bouquets wondering if he'll have as many when his time comes. Remember, the brain is not a safe place to think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.